Preface to the 8th edition of Principles of Economics, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Principles of Economics, Book 1. Preface to the 8th edition. This edition is a reprint of the 7th, which was almost a reprint of the 6th, the only changes being in small matters of detail. The preface is almost the same as in the 7th edition. It is now thirty years since the first edition of this book implied a promise that a second volume, completing the treatise, would appear within a reasonable time. But I had laid my plan on too large a scale, and its scope widened, especially on the realistic side, with every pulse of that industrial revolution of the present generation, which has far outdone the changes of a century ago, in both rapidity and breadth of movement. So, ere long, I was compelled to abandon my hope of completing the work in two volumes. My subsequent plans were changed more than once partly by the course of events, partly by my other engagements, and the decline of my strength. Industry and Trade, published in 1919, is in effect a continuation of the present volume. A third, on Trade, Finance, and the Industrial Future, is far advanced. The three volumes are designed to deal with the chief problems of economics, so far as the writer's power extends. The present volume therefore remains as a general introduction to the study of economic science, similar in some respects, though not all, to that of volumes on foundations, Grand Lagen, which Rajcher and some other economists have put in the forefront of groups of semi-independent volumes on economics. It avoids such special topics as currency and the organization of markets, and, in regards to such matters as structure of industry, employment, and the problem of wages, it deals mainly with normal conditions. Economic evolution is gradual. Its progress is sometimes arrested or reversed by political catastrophes. But its forward movements are never sudden, for even in the Western world and in Japan it is based on habit, partly conscious, partly unconscious. And though an inventor or an organizer or a financier of genius may seem to have modified the economic structure of a people almost at a stroke, yet that part of his influence, which has not been merely superficial and transitory, is found on inquiry to have done little more than bring to head a broad constructive movement which had long been in preparation. Those manifestations of nature which occur most frequently, and are so orderly that they can be closely watched and narrowly studied, are the basis of economic as of most other scientific work. While those that are spasmatic, infrequent, and difficult of observation are commonly reserved for special examination at a later stage, and the motto, Natura non facit saltum, is specially appropriate to a volume on economic foundations. An illustration of this contrast may be taken from the distribution of the study of large businesses between the present volume and that of, on industry and trade. When any branch of industry offers an open field for new firms which rise to the first rank, and perhaps after a time decay, the normal cost of production in it can be estimated with reference to a representative firm, which enjoys a fair share both of the, those internal economies which belong to a well-organized individual business and of those general or external economies which arise out of the collective organization of the district as a whole. A study of such a firm belongs properly in a volume on foundations. So also does a study on the, of the principles on which a firmly established monopoly in the hands of a government department or large railway regulates its prices with main reference indeed to its own revenue, but also with a more or less consideration for the well-being of its customers. But normal action falls into the background when trusts are striving for the mastery of a large market when communities of interest are being made and unmade, and, above all, when the policy of any particular establishment is likely to be governed, not with a single eye to its own business success, but in subordination of some large stock exchange maneuver, or some campaign for the control of markets. Such matters cannot be fitly discussed in a volume on foundations. They belong to a volume dealing with some part of the superstructure. The mech of the economist lies in economic biology, rather than in economic dynamics. But biological conceptions are more complex than those of mechanics. A volume on foundations must therefore give a relatively large place to mechanical analogies, and frequent use is made of the term equilibrium, which suggests something of a statical analogy. This fact, combined with the predominant attention paid in the present volume to the normal conditions of life in the modern age, has suggested the notion that its central idea is statical rather than dynamical. But in fact, it is concerned throughout with the forces that cause movement, and its keynote is that of dynamics rather than statics. The forces to be dealt with are, however, so numerous that it is best to take a few at a time, and to work out a number of partial solutions as auxiliaries to our main study. 
Thus we begin by isolating the primary relations of supply, demand, and price in regard to a particular co commodity. We reduce to an action all other forces by the phrase other things being equal. We do not suppose that they are inert, but for the time we ignore their activity. This scientific device is a great deal older than science. It is the method by which, consciously or unconsciously, sensible men have dealt from time immemorial with every difficult problem of ordinary life. In the second stage, more forces are released from the hypothetical slumber that had been imposed on them. Changes in the conditions of demand for and supply of particular groups of commodities come into play, and their complex mutual interactions begin to be observed. Gradually, the area of the dynamical problem becomes larger, the area covered by provisional statical assumptions becomes smaller, and at last is reached the greater central problem of the distribution of the national dividend among a vast number of different agents of production. Meanwhile, the dynamical principle of substitution is seen ever at work, causing the demand for and the supply of any one set of agents of production to be influenced through indirect channels by the movements of demand and supply in relation to other agents, even though situated in far remote fields of the industry. The main concern of economics is thus with human beings who are impelled, for good and evil, to change and progress. Fragmentary statical hypotheses are used as temporary auxiliaries to dynamical, or rather biological, conceptions. But the central idea of economics, even when its foundations alone are under discussion, must be that of, li must be that of living force and movement. There have been stages in social history in which the special features of the income yielded by the ownership of land have dominated human relations, and perhaps they may again assert a preeminence. But in the present age, the opening out of new countries, aided by low transport charges on land and sea, has almost suspended the tendency to diminishing return, in that sense in which the term was used by Malthus and Ricardo, when English laborers' weekly wages were often less than the price of half a bushel of good wheat. And yet, if the growth of, the growth of population should continue for very long, even at a quarter of its present rate, the aggregate rental values of land for all its uses, assumed to be as free as now from restraint by public authority, may again exceed the aggregate of incomes derived from all other forms of material property, even though that may em then embody 20 times as much labor as now. Increasing stress has been laid in successive editions up to the present on these facts, and also on the correlated fact that in every branch of production and trade there is margin up to which an increased application of any agent will be profitable under given conditions, but beyond which its further application will yield a diminishing return unless there be some increase of demand accompanied by an appropriate increase of other agents of production needed to cooperate with it. And a similar increasing stress has been laid on the complementary fact that this notion of a margin is not uniform and absolute. It varies with the conditions of the problem in hand, and in particular with the period of time to which reference is being made. The rules are universal that, one, marginal costs do not govern price, two, it is only at the margin that the actions of those forces which do govern price can be made to stand out in clear light, and three, the margin, which must be studied in reference to long periods and enduring results, differs in character as well as in extent from that which must be studied in reference to short periods and to passing fluctuations. Variations in the nature of marginal costs are indeed largely responsible for the well-known fact that those effects of an economic cause, which are not easily traced, are frequently more important than, and in opposite direction to, those which lie on the surface and attract the eye of the casual observer. This is one of those fundamental difficulties which have underlain and troubled the economic analysis of past times. Its full significance is perhaps not yet generally recognized, and much more work may be, need to be done before it is fully mastered. The new analysis is endeavoring gradually and tentatively to bring over into economics, as far as the widely different nature of the material will allow, those methods of the science of small increments, commonly called the differential calculus to which man owes directly or indirectly the greater part of control that he has obtained in recent times over physical nature. It is still in its infancy. It has no dogma and no standard of orthodoxy. It has not yet had time to obtain a perfectly settled terminology, and some of the differences as to the best use of terms and other subordinate matters are but a sign of healthy life. In fact, however, there is a remarkable harmony and agreement on essentials among those who are working constructively by the new method and especially among such of them that have served an apprenticeship in the simpler and more definite, and therefore more advanced, problems of physics. Ere another generation has passed, 
Its dominion over that limited but important field of economic inquiry to which it's, it is appropriate will probably be no longer in dispute. My wife has aided and advised me at every stage of successive editions of this volume. Each one of them owes a great deal to her suggestion, and her care, and her judgment. Dr. Keynes and Mr. L. L. Price read through the proofs of the first edition and helped me greatly. And Mr. A. W. Flux has done much for me. Among the many who have helped me on special points, in some cases in regard to more than one edition, I would specially mention Professors Ashley, Cannon, Edgeworth, Haverfield, Pigou, and Tossig, Dr. Barry, Mr. C. R. Fay, and the late Professor Sidgwick. End of the preface to the eighth edition. Principles of Economics, Book One, by Alfred Marshall.